Hi everyone, I'm Sharon. I'm going to be reading chapter 3 of The Woman Warrior. Once in a long while, four times so far for me, my mother brings out the metal tube that holds her medical diploma. On the tube are gold circles crossed with seven red lines, each joy, ideographs, and abstract. There are also little flowers that look like gears for a gold machine. According to the scraps of labels with Chinese and American addresses, stamps, and postmarks, the family airmailed the can from Hong Kong in 1950. It got crushed in the middle, and whoever tried to peel the labels off stopped because the red and gold paint came off too, leaving silver scratches that rust. Somebody tried to prise the end off before discovering that the tube falls apart. When I open it, the smell of China flies out a thousand-year-old bat flying heavy-handed out of the Chinese caverns where bats are as white as dust, a smell that comes from long ago, far back in the brain. Crates from Canton, Hong Kong, Singapore, and Taiwan have that smell too, only stronger because they are more recently come from the Chinese. Inside the can are three squirrels, one inside another. The largest say that in the 23rd year of the National Republic, the Tokong School of Midwifery, where she has had two years of instruction in hospital practice, awards a diploma to my mother, to my mother who has shown through oral and written examination her proficiency in midwifery, pediatrics, gynecology, medicine, surgery, therapeutics, ophthalmology, bacteriology, dermatology, nursing, and bandage. This document has eight stamps on it. One school's English and Chinese names embossed together in a circle. One as a Chinese enumerate, a stork and a big baby in lavender, er, lavender ink. One the school's Chinese seal. One an orangish, orangish paper stamp pasted in the border design. One the red seal of Dr. Wu Pak Liang, MD, Lyon, Berlin, President and Ex-Assistant Extranjera a la Comique. I don't know how to read that. <laughs> One, the red seal of Dean Wu Kin Kam Ying Kam MD. One, my mother's seal, her chop mark larger than a president's in a dean. And one, the number 1279 on the back. Dean Wu's signature is followed by Hackett. I read in a history book that Hackett Medical College for Women at Canton was founded in the 19th century by European women doctors. The school seal has been pressed over a photograph of my mother at the age of 37. The diploma gives her age as 27. She looks younger than I do. Her eyebrows are thicker, lips fuller. Her naturally curly hair is parted on the left, one wavy wisp tendrilling off to the right. She wears a scholar's white gown and she is not thinking about her appearance. She stares straight ahead as if she can see me and pass me to her grandchildren and her grandchildren's grandchildren. She has spacey eyes as all people recently from Asia have. Her eyes do not focus on the camera. My mother is not smiling. Chinese do not smile for photographs. Their faces command relatives in foreign lands, send money and posterity forever. Put food in front of this picture. My mother does not understand Chinese American snapshots. What are you laughing at? She asks. The second scroll is a long narrow photograph of the graduating class of the school officials seated in front. I picked out my mother immediately. Her face is exactly her own, though 40 years younger. She is so familiar. I can only tell whether she, or not she is pretty or happy or smart by comparing her to the other women. For this form formal group picture, she straightened her hair of oil to make a chin-length bob like the others. On the other women, strangers, I can recognize a curled lip, sidelong glance, pinched shoulders. My mother is not soft. The girl with the swan nose and the dimpled underlip is soft. My mother is not humorous, not like the girls at the end who lifts her mocking chin to pose like a girl graduate. My mother does not have smiling eyes. The old woman teacher, Dean Wu, in front, crinkles happily, and the one faculty member in a western suit smiles westernly. Most of the graduates are girls whose faces have not formed. My mother's face will not change anymore, except to age. She is intelligent, alert, pretty. I can't tell if she's happy. The graduates seem to have been looking elsewhere when they pinned a rose, zinnia, or chrysanthemum on their precise black dresses. One thin girl wears hers in the middle of the chest. A few have a flower over the left or right nipple. My mother puts hers a chrysanthemum below her left breasts. Chinese dresses at that time were dartless, cut as if the women did not have breasts. These young doctors, unaccustomed to decorations, may have seen the chest as a black expanses with no reference points for flowers. Perhaps they couldn't have shortened that far gaze that lasts only a few years after our Chinese immigrants. In this picture, too many to my mother's eyes are big. 
with what they held, reaches of oceans beyond China, land beyond oceans. Most immigrants learned the barbarians' directness, how to gather themselves and stare rudely into talking faces as if to, trying to catch lies. In America, my mother has eyes as strong as boulders, never once skittering off a face, but she has not learned to de place decorations and photo photographed needles, nor has she stopped seeing land on the other side of the oceans. Now her eyes include the re relatives in China, as they once included my father smiling and smiling in his many Western outfits, a different one for each photograph that he sent from America. He and his friends took pictures of one another in bathing suits at Coney Island Beach, the salt wind from the Atlantic blowing their hair. He's the one in the middle with his arms about the necks of his buddies. They pose in a cockpit of a biplane on a motorcycle and on a lawn inside a keep off the grass sign. They are always laughing. My father, white shirt sleeves rolled up, smiles in front of a wall of clean laundry. In the spring, he wears a new straw hat, cocked at a Fred Astaire angle. He steps out, dancing down the stairs, one foot forward, one hand, one back, a hand in his pocket. He wrote to her about the American custom of stomping on straw hats come fall. If you want to save your hat for next year, he said, you have to put it away early, or else when you're riding the subway or walking down Fifth Avenue, any stranger can snatch it off your head and put his foot through it. That's the way they celebrate the change of seasons here. In the winter, he wears a gray felt hat with a gray overcoat. He is sitting on a rock in Central Park. In one snapshot, he is not smiling. Someone took it while he was studying, blurred in the glare of the desk lamp. There are no snapshots of my mother. In two small, small portraits, however, there is a black thumbprint on her forehead as if someone had inked in bangs, as if someone had marked her. Mother, did bangs come into fashion after you had the picture taken? One time she said yes. Another time when I asked, why do you have fingerprints on your forehead? She said, your first uncle did it. I disliked the unsureness in her voice. The last scroll has columns of Chinese words. The only English is Department of Health, Canton, imprinted on my mother's face the same photograph as a diploma. I keep looking to see whether she was afraid. Year after year, my mother, my father did not come home or send for her. Their two children had been dead for 10 years. If he did not return soon, there would be no more children. They were three and two years old, a boy and a girl. They could talk already. My father did send money regularly, though, and she had nobody to spend it on but herself. She bought good clothes and shoes, and she decided to use the money for becoming a doctor. She did not leave for Canton immediately after the children died. In China, there was time to complete feelings. As my father had done, my mother left the village by ship. There was a seabird painted on the ship to protect it against shipwreck and winds. She was in luck. The following ship was boarded by river pirates, who kidnapped every passenger, even the old ladies. Sixty dollars for an old lady was what the bandits used to say. I sailed alone, she said, to the capital of the entire province. She took a brown leather suitcase and a sea bag stuffed with two quilts. At the dormitory, the school official assigned her to a room of five other women who were unpacking when she came in. They greeted her as she greeted them, but no one wanted to start friendship until the unpacking was done, each item placed precisely to section off the room. My mother spotted the name she had written on her application pinned to a headboard, and the annoyance she felt at not arriving early enough her first choice disappeared. The locks in her suitcase opened with two satisfying clicks. She enjoyed again how neatly her belongings fit together, clean against the green lining. She refolded the clothes before putting them in the one drawer that was hers. Then she took out her pens and ink box, an atlas of the world, a tea set, a tea canister, a sewing box, a ruler with real gold markings, writing paper, envelopes of a thick red stripe to signify no bad news, her bowl and silver chopsticks. These things she arranged one by one on her shelf. She spread the two quilts on top of her bed and put her slippers side by side underneath. She owned more, furniture, wedding jewelry, cloth, photographs, but she had left such troublesome valuables behind in the family's care. She never did get all of it back. The women who had arrived early did not offer to help unpack not wanting to interfere with the pleasure and the privacy of it. Not many women get to live on out the daydream of a woman, to have a room, even a section of a room, that only gets messed up when she messes it up herself. The book would stay open at the very page she had pressed flat of her hand, and no one would complain about the field not being pulled or the leak in the roof. She would clean her own bowl in a small limited area. She would have one drawer to sort one bed to make. 
to shut the door at the end of the workday, which does not spill over into the eaten thing, to throw away books after reading them so they don't have to be dusted, to go through boxes on New Year's Eve and throw out half of what is inside, sometimes for extravagance to pick a bunch of flowers for one table. Other women besides me must have had this daydream about carefree life. I've seen communist pictures showing a contented woman sitting on her bunk sewing. Above her head is one box on a shelf. The words stenciled on the box means fragile, but literally say, use a little heart. The woman looks very pleased. The revolution put an end to prostitution by giving women what they wanted, a job and a room of their own. Free from families, my mother would live for two years without servitude. She would not have to run errands for my father's tyrant mother with the bound feet or thread needles for old ladies, but neither would there be slaves or nieces to wait on her. Now she would get hot water only if she bribed a concierge. When I went to school, my mother said, give the concierge oranges. Two of my mother's roommates, who had organized their corners to their satisfaction, made tea and set a small table of their leftover travel food. Have you eaten, lady scholar? They invited my mother. Lady scholar, come drink tea. They said to each of the others, bring your own cup. This largesse moved my mother tea, an act of humility. She brought out meats and figs she had preserved on the farm. Everyone complimented her on her tastiness. Their mother told which villages they came from and the names they would go by. My mother did not let it be known that she had already had two children and that some of these girls were young enough to be her daughters. Then everyone went to the auditorium for two hours of speeches by the faculty. They told the students that they would begin with a text as old as the Han Empire, when the prescription for immortality had not yet been lost. Chang Chang Ching, father of medicine, had told how the two great winds, yin and yang, blew through the human body. The diligent students would do well to begin tonight memorizing his book on colds and fevers. After they had mastered the ancient cures that worked, they would be taught the most up-to-date Western discoveries. By the time the students graduated, those of them who persevered, their range of knowledge would be wider than that of any other doctor in history. Women have been now practicing medicine for about 50 years, said one of the teachers, a woman who complimented them for adding to their growing number and also for coming to a school that taught modern medicine. You will bring science to the villages. At the end of the program, the faculty turned their backs to the students and everyone bowed the three rows toward the picture of Dr. Sonia Sen, he was a Western surgeon before he became a revolutionary. Then they went to the dining hall to eat. My mother began memorizing her books immediately after supper. There were two places where a student could study. The dining hall with its tables cleared for work, everyone chanting during the common memorization sessions, or the table in her own room. My, most students went to the dining hall for company there. My mother usually stayed in her room, or when a roommate also wanted privacy, went to a secret hiding place where she had hunted out during the first week of school. Once in a while, she dropped by the dining hall, chanted for a short while with the most advanced group, not missing a single syllable, yawned early and said goodnight. She quickly built a reputation for being brilliant, a natural scholar who would glance at a book and know it. The other students fought over who could sit next to me at my exams, said my mother, one glimpse at my paper when they got stuck and then they could keep going. Did you ever try to stop them from copying your paper? Of course not. They only needed to pick up a word or two and then they could remember the test. That's not copying. You get a lot more clues in the actual diagnosis. Patients talk endlessly about their ailments. I'd feel their pulses knocking away under my very fingertips, so much clearer than the paper dolls in a textbook. I'd chant the symptoms and those few words would start a whole chapter of cures tumbling out. Most people don't have the brains to do that. She pointed at the photograph of 37 graduates. 112 students began at the same course at, at the course at the same time that I did. She suspected that she did not have the right kind of brains either. My father, the one who could recite whole poems, to make up the lack, she did secret studying. She also gave herself 20 years head start over the young girls, although she admitted to only 10, which already forced her to push. Older people were expected to be smarter; they are closer to gods. She did not want to overhear students or teachers say, she must be exceedingly stupid, doing no better than anyone else which is a generation older. She is so dumb, she has to study day and night. I study far in advance, my, said my mother. I studied when the breathing came from the beds and coming through the wood walls was deep and even. The night before exams, when the other students stayed up, I went to bed early. They would say, aren't you going to go study? And I'd say, no, I'm going to do some mending or I want to write letters tonight. I let them take turns sitting next to me at the tests. 
The sweat of hard work is not to be displayed. It is much more graceful to be appeared favored by the gods. Maybe my mother's secret place was the room in the dormitory which was haunted. Even though they had to crowd the other rooms, none of the young women would sleep in it. Accustomed to nestling of a, ne a bed full of siblings and grannies, they fitted their privacy tighter than, rather than claim the haunted room as human territory. No one had lived in it for at least five years, not since a series of hauntings had made its habitants come down with ghost fear that shattered their brains for studying. The haunted ones would give a high start startled cries, pointing at the air, which sure enough was becoming hazy. They would suddenly turn and go back the way they came. When they rounded a corner, they flattened themselves fast against the building to catch what un followed unawares, moving steadily forward. One girl tore up the photographs she had taken of friends in that room. A stranger of arms hanging at its side, who stood beside the wall in the background of the photograph, was a ghost. The girl would insist there was nobody there when she took the picture. That was a photo ghost, my mother said when the students talked story. She needn't be afraid. Most ghosts are only nightmares. Somebody should have held her and wiggled her ears to wake her up. My mother relished these scare orgies. She was good at naming. Wall ghost, frog spirit, frogs are heavenly chickens. Eating partner. She could find descriptions of phenomena in ancient writings. The green phoenix stories, the seven strange tales of the golden bottle, what Confucius did not talk about. She could validate ghost sightings. But ghosts can't just be nightmares, the storyteller po protested. They come right out into the room. Once her whole family saw wine cups spinning and incense sticks waving through the air. They got the magic monk to watch it all night. He also saw the incense tips tracing orange figures in the dark. Ideographs, he said. He followed the glow patterns of his ink brush on a red paper. And there it was, a message from our great grandfather. We needed, they, we needed to put bigger helpings in a ford in front of his plaque, and when we did, the haunting stopped immediately. I like to think the ancestors are busier than that, my mother said, or more at rest. Yes, they're probably more at rest. Perhaps it was an animal spirit that was bothering your house, and your grandfather had something to do with chasing it off. After what she thought was a suitable, tact, suitably tactful pause, she said, How do we know that ghosts are a continuance of dead people? Couldn't ghosts be an entirely different species of creature? Perhaps human beings just die, and that's the end. I don't think I mind that too much. Which would you rather be, a ghost who is constantly wanting to be fed, or nothing? If the other storytellers had been reassuring one another with science, then my mother would have thrown stories as factual as bats into the listening night. A practical woman, she could not invent stories and told only true ones. But tonight the younger women were huddling together under the quilts, the ghost room with its doors open steps away. Did you hear that? Someone would whisper. And sure enough, whenever their voices stilled simultaneously, a thump or a creak would unmistakably sound somewhere inside the building. The girls would jump closer together, giggling. That was the wind, my mother would say. That was somebody who fell asleep reading in bed. She dropped her book. She neither jumped nor giggled. If you're so sure, said an impertinent girl, perhaps the one with the disdainful chin, why don't you go out there and take a look? Of course, my mother said. I was just thinking about doing that, and she took a lamp and left her friends. Impressed, in a dimmer room. She advanced steadily, walking the angular shadows up and down a corridor. She walked to both ends of the hallway, then explored another wing for good measure. At the ghost room, door opened like a wound. She stopped and, stepping inside, swung light into its corners. She saw cloth bags and knobby mounds. They looked like gnomes, were not, but were not gnomes. Suitcases and boxes threw shadow stairs up the walls and across the floor. Nothing unusual loomed at her or scurried away. No temperature change, no smell. She turned her back on the room and slowly walked through one more wing. She did not want to get back too soon. Her friend, although one owes nothing to friends, must be satisfied that she searched thoroughly. After a sufficiently brave time, she returned to the storytellers. I saw nothing, she said. There's nothing to be afraid of in the whole dormitory, including the ghost room. I checked there too. I was just inside there now. The haunting begins at midnight, said the girl, the adamantine chin. It's not quite eleven. My mother may have been afraid, but she could be a dragoness. My totem, your totem. She could make herself not weak. During danger, she fanned out her dragon claws and riffled her red sequin scales and unfolded folded her coiling green stripes. Danger was a good time for showing off. 
Like the dragon living in Temple Eves, my mother looked down on plain people who were lonely and afraid. I'm so sleepy, my mother said. I don't want to wait up until midnight. I'll go sleep in the ghost room. Then if anything happens, I won't miss it. I hope I'll be able to recognize the ghost when I see it. Sometimes ghosts put on such mundane disguises. They aren't particularly interesting. Ayah, ayah, the storyteller explained. My mother laughed with satisfaction at their cries. I'll call out if something bad happens to me, she said. If you come running all together, you will probably be able to scare their ghost away. Some of them promised to come. Some offered their talismans, a, peach, a branch from a peach tree, a Christian cross, a red paper with good words written on it. But my mother refused them all. If I take charms, then the ghost will hide from me. I won't learn what kind of ghost it is or whether or not a ghost lives there at all. I'll only bring my knife to defend myself and a novel in case I get bored and can't sleep. You keep the charms. Should I call for help, bring them with you. She went to her own room and got a weapon and a book, though not a novel, but a textbook. Two of her roommates walked her to the ghost room. Aren't you afraid? They asked. What is there to be afraid of? She asked. What could a ghost do to me? But my mother did pause at the door. Listen, she said, if I am very afraid when you find me, don't forget to tweak my ears, call my name, and tell me how to get home. She told him her personal name. She walked directly to the back of the room where the boxes formed a window seat. She sat with the lamp beside her and stared at the yellow and black reflection in the night glass. I am very pretty, she thought. She cupped her hands to the window to see out. A thin moon pricked through the clouds and a long grass waved. That is the same moon that they see in a new society village, she thought. The same stars. That is the same moon that they see in China. The, small, the same stars, though shifted a little. When she set the lamp next to the bed, the room seemed darker, the uncurtained window letting in the bare night. She wrapped herself well in her cloak, which her mother had made before dying young. In the middle of one border, my grandmother, grand grandmother had sewn a tiny satin triangle, a red heart to protect my mother at the neck, as if she were a baby yet. My mother read aloud. Perhaps the others could hear how calmly. A ghost might hear too. She did not know whether her voice would evoke or disperse it. Soon the ideographs lifted her feet, stretched out their wings, and flew like blackbirds. The dots were their eyes. Her own eyes drooped. She closed her book and turned off the lamp. A new darkness pulled away the room, inked out flesh and outlined bones. My mother was wide awake again. She became herself sharply, bone wire antenna, but she was not afraid. She had been pared down like this before when she traveled up the mountains into rare snow, alone in white, not unlike being alone in black. She had also sailed a boat safely between land and land. She did not know whether she had fallen asleep or not when she heard a rushing coming out from under the bed. Cringes of fear seized her souls as something alive, rumbling, climbed the foot of the bed and rolled over her and landed bodily on her chest. There it sat, it breathed airlessly, pressing her, snap, tapping her. Oh no, a sitting ghost, she thought. She pushed, it, she pushed against the creature to lever herself up from underneath it, but it absorbed its energy and got heavier. Her fingers and palms became damp, shrinking at the ghost's thick, short hair like an animal coat, which slides against the warm solidity as human flesh slides against muscle and bones. She grabbed clutches of fur and pulled. She pinched the skin the hair grew out of and gouged into it over her fingernails. She forced her hands to hunt out eyes, furtive somewhere in the hair, but could not find any. She lifted her head to bite, but fell back exhausted. The mask thickened. She could see the knife, which was catching the moonlight near the lamp. Her arm had become an immensity, though too burdensome to lift. If she could only move it to the edge of the bed, perhaps it would fall off and reach the knife. As if feeding on her very thoughts, the ghost it spread, spread itself over her arm. A high ringing sound somewhere had grown loud enough so that she heard it, and she understood that it had started humming at the edge of her brain before the ghost appeared. She breathed shallowly, panting and as in childbirth, and could not shout out. The room sang, its air electric with the ringing. Surely someone would come here and help. Come, would cut, would hear and come help. Earlier in the night, on the other side of the ringing, she could hear women's voices talking. But soon their conversations had ceased. The school slept. She could feel that the souls had gone traveling. There was a lightness not in a dormitory during the day. Without looking at the babies on her back or in the cribs, she had always been able to tell. After the rocking and singing and bedtime stories and keeping still not to startle them, the moment when they fell asleep, a tensing goes out of their bodies out of the house. Beyond the horror in the ghost room, she felt this release throughout the dormitory. No one would come to see how she was doing. 
You will not win, Boulder, she spoke to the ghost. You do not belong here. And I will see to it that you leave. When morning comes, only one of us will control this room, ghost, and that will be me. I will be marching in its length and width. I will be dancing, not sliding and creeping like you. I will go right out that door, but I'll come back. Do you know what gift I will bring you? I'll get fire, ghost. You made a mistake haunting a medical school. We have cabinets full of alcohol, laboratories full. We have a communal kitchen with human-sized jars of oils and cooking fat, enough to burn for a month without skipping a single fried meal. I will pour alcohol into my wash bucket and I will set fire to it. Ghost, I will burn you out. I will swing the bucket across the ceiling. Down from the kitchen, my friends will come back of the lard. When we fire it, the smoke will fill every crack and corner. Where will you hide, ghost? I will make this room so clean, no ghost will ever visit here again. I do not give in, she said. There is no pain you can inflict that I cannot endure. You're wrong to think if I'm afraid of you. You're no mystery to me. I've heard of you sitting ghosts before. Yes, people have lived to tell about you. You kill babies, you cowards. You have no power over a strong woman. You are no more dangerous than a nestling cat. My dog sits on my feet more heavily than you can. You think this is suffering? I can make my ring ears ring louder by taking aspirin. Are, are these all the tricks you have, ghosts? Sitting and ringing? That is nothing. A broom ghost can do better. You cannot even assume an interesting shape, merely a boulder. A hairy butt boulder. He must not be a ghost at all, of course. There are no such thing as ghosts. Let me instruct you, boulder. When Yen, the teacher, was grading the provincial exams one year, a thing of hair as ugly as yours plopped itself on his desk. The one has, that one had glaring eyes, though, so he wasn't blind and stupid like you. Yen picked up his furrow and hit it like a student. He chased it around the room, and it wasn't lame and lazy. And then it vanished. Later, Yen told us, after life, the rational soul descends the dragon. The sentient soul descends the dragon. So in the world, there can be no ghosts. This thing must have been a fox spirit. That, that must be just what you are, a fox spirit. You are so hairy. You must be a fox that doesn't even know how to transform itself. You're not clever for a fox spirit, I must say. No tricks, no blood. Where are your hangman's rotting noose and icy breath? No sh throwing shoes into the rafters? No metamorphosis into a beautiful sad lady? No disguises in my dead relative shapes. No drowned women with seaweed hair. No riddles or penalty games. You are a puny little boulder indeed. Yes, when I get my oil, I will fry you for breakfast. She then ignored a ghost on her chest and chanted her lessons for the next day's classes. The moon moved from one window to another, and as dawn came, the thing scurried off, climbing qu quickly down the foot of the bed. She fell asleep until time for school. She had said she was going to sleep in her room, and that, and so that, and so she did. She awoke when the students came tumbling into the room. What happened, they asked, getting under the quilt to keep warm. Did anything happen? Take my earlobes, please, said my mother, and pull them back and forth. In case I lost any of myself, I want you to call me back. I was afraid, and fear may have driven me out of my body and mind. Then I will tell you the story. Two friends clasped her hands, while a third held her finger, he held her head and took each earlobe between thumb and forefinger, wiggling them and chanting, Come home, come home, brave orchid, who has fought against the ghosts and won. Return to Tu Kong School, Kwantung City, Kwantung Province. Your classmates are here waiting for you, scholarly, brave orchid. Come home, come home. Come back and help us with our lessons. School is starting soon. Come for breakfast. Return, daughter of New Society Village, Kwantung Province. Your brother and sisters call you. Your friends call you. We need you. Return to us. Return to us at Tokun School. There's work to do. Come back, Dr. Brave Orchid. Be unafraid. Be unafraid. You are safe now in the Tokun School. All is safe. Return. Abundant comfort and long restoring waves warmed my mother. Her soul returned fully to her and nestled happily inside her skin for this moment not traveling in the past where her children were, nor to America to be with my father. She was back among many people. She rested after battle. She let friends watch out for her. There, said the roommate, giving her ear a last hearty tug. You are cured. Now tell us what happened. I have finished reading my novel, said my mother, and still nothing happened. I was listening to the dogs bark far away. Suddenly, a full-grown sitting ghost loomed up to the ceiling and pounced on top of me. Mounds of hair hid its claws and teeth. No true head, no eyes, no face, so low in its level incarnation it did, not having the shape of a recognizable animal. It knocked me down and began to strangle me. 
It was bigger than the wolf, bigger than the ape, and growing. I would have stabbed it. I would have cut it up, and we would be mopping blood this morning. But a sitting ghost mutation, it had an extra arm that rusted my hand away from the knife. At about 3 a.m., I died for a while. I was wandering, and the world I touched turned to sand. I could hear wind, but the sand did not fly. For 10 years, I lost my way. I almost forgot about you. There was so much work leading up to another work and another life, like picking up coins in a dream. But I returned. I walked from the Gobi Desert to this room in the Tokwang School. That took another two years at winning wall ghosts en route. The way to do that is to go straight. Do not play their side, side games. In confusion, they will instantly revert to the real stakes, weak and sad humanity. No matter what, don't commit suicide or you will not have places to trade with the wall with the whale ghost. If you are not put off by the foot-long, lolling tongue and the popped-out eyes of the hand ones, or the open veins or the drowned skin and seaweed hair, you shouldn't become because you'll be because you're doctors. You can chant these poor souls on to the light. No white bats and no black bats flew ahead to guide me to my natural death. Either I would die without my whole life, or I would not die. I did not die. I am brave and good. Also, I have bodily strength and control. Good people do not lose to ghosts. Although I was gone for 12 years, but in this room only an hour had passed. The moon barely moved. By silver light, I saw the black thing pulling shadows into itself, setting up magnetic whirls. Soon it would be sucked into the room and begin, begin on the rest of the dormitory. It would eat us up. It threw boulders at me. And then there was a sound like a mountain wind, a sound so high it could drive you crazy. Didn't you hear it? Yes, they had. Wasn't it like the electric wires that one sometimes heard in a city? Yes, it was the sound of energy amassing. You were lucky you slept because the sound tears the heart. I could hear babies crying in it. I could hear tortured people screaming the cries of their relatives who had to watch. Yes, yes, I recognize that. That must have been the singing I heard in my dream. It may be sounding even now, though too strangely for our daytime ears. You cannot hit the ghost if you sleep under the bed. The ghost fattens at night, its dark sacks empty by daylight. It's a good thing I stopped it feeding on me. Blood and meat would have given it strength to feed on you. I made my will an eggshell encasing the monster's fur so that hollow hairs could not draw. I never let up willing its small size smaller, its hairs to retract until by dawn the sitting ghost temporarily disappeared. The danger is not over. The ghost is listening right now, and tonight it will walk strong it will walk again but stronger. We, we may not be able to control it if you do not help me fill it, finish it off by sundown. This sitting ghost has many wide black mouths. It is dangerous. It is real. Many ghosts make such brief and gauzy appearances that eyewitnesses doubt their own, ex their own sightings. This one can conjure up enough su substance to sit solidly throughout the night. It is a serious ghost, not at all playful. It does not twirl incense sticks and throw shoes and dishes. It does not play peekaboo or wear fright masks. It does not bother with tricks. It wants lives. I am sure it is surfeited with babies and is now coming after adults. It grows. It is mysterious, not merely a copy of ourselves, as after all the hangman and seaweed women are. It could be hiding right now in a piece of wood or inside one of your dolls. Perhaps in daylight we accept that bag to be just a bag. She pointed with a plat the flat of her palm as if it balanced atop. But in reality, it is a big ghost. The students moved away from the bag in which they collected their quilting scraps and pulled up their feet that was dangling over the edge of the bed. You have to help me get rid of this world of disease, as invisible and deadly as bacteria. After classes, come back here of your buckets, alcohol, oil. You can find dog's blood, too. Our work will go fast. Act unafraid. Ghost chasers have to be brave. If the ghost comes after you, though I would not expect an attack during the day, spit at it, scorn at it. The hero in a ghost story laughs, a nimble laugh, his life so full it splatters red and gold on all the creatures around him. These young women, who would have to back up their science of magical spells should their patients be disappointed and not get well, not hurry to get their classes on time. The story about the ghost's appearance and the combing ghost chase grew. The students snatched alcohol and matches from the laboratories. My mother directed arrangement of the buckets and burners into orderly rows and divided the fuel. Let's fire the oil all at once, she said. Now. Whoop, whoop. My mother told the sound of new fire so that I could remember it. Whoop, whoop. The alcohol burned a floating blue. The terry oil, which someone had brought from the village witch, fumed in black clouds. My mother swung a big bucket overhead. 
and smoke curled in black bubbles around the women in their scholars' black gowns. They walked in a ghost circle, this circle of little black women, lifting smoke and fire up to the ceiling corners, down to the floor corners, moving clouds across the walls and floors, under the bed, around one another. I told you, ghost, my mother chanted, that we would come after you. We told you, ghost, that we would come after you, said this woman. Daylight has come yellow, yellow and red, sang my mother, and we are winning. Run, ghost, run from the school. Only good medical people belong here. Go back, dark creature, to your native country. Go home, go home, go home. Sang the woman. When the smoke cleared, I think my mother said that under the bed, under the foot of the bed, the students found a piece of wood dripping with blood. They burned it in one of the pots, and the stench was like a corpse exhumed for its bones too soon. They laughed at the smell.